Thank you, Molly. Thank you all so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was mentioning to Molly beforehand, I'm just very impressed with your conference and with the enthusiasm of your grassroots. And that's an important point uh, in this debate, the stem cell debate, as well as in the other debates in life, that uh, the grassroots really get involved. Now, part of that involvement is uh, having some folks train you a little bit on some of the facts so you're ready, you're armed, you're ready to get out there and so on. And that's what I'm aiming to do, at least today, in terms of stem cells. Uh, Molly mentioned that, you know, there's been a lot of confusion in the past. There still is. In fact, by the end of today's lecture, you will know more about stem cells than 50% of the physicians in the U.S. There's still a lot of misunderstanding and ignorance out there. So one of my challenges to you, I'll say it now, but repeat it again at the end, is for you to get out there and talk about these facts and get the truth out to folks in your parish, to folks at work, to folks at your school. So, if we could have the slides up here. Uh, here's what a lot of people know or don't know about stem cells. You've got a bunch uh, of little ones coming up here to the pearly gates of St. Peter. He goes, uh, partial birth abortion? And they go, no, stem cell research. In particular, embryonic stem cell research. You're aware of the nearly 60 million lives lost in the U.S. alone due to abortion. But there are probably nearly 50 million human embryos that have been sacrificed in scientific research, including embryonic stem cell research. There's a tremendous loss of life, and we need to be aware of that and fight against that as well. There's a basic biological fact here that we all began at conception, at fertilization. And I thought it was interesting. I came across this little uh, story in one of the two leading scientific journals in the world, a journal called Nature. Your destiny from day one. The scientific fact is, yeah, our lives all began right there at that single cell stage. You were a new human organism. That's the biological fact. I wanted to, to head off just briefly and talk about fetal tissue because it's been in the news, it'll be in the news again. David Daleiden's great videos exposing the trafficking of baby body parts, hearts and brains and other tissues. It's not really about stem cells, but what did we hear? It was the same sort of mantra that we hear about embryonic stem cells. Oh, well, we're going to transplant those tissues and cure all of these diseases. Well, we did a little study. And, and at the Charlotte Lozier Institute, we're sort of the, the science geeks for the Susan B. Anthony List and other pro-life groups to provide the background stories, to provide the facts for the folks out in the grassroots, the advocates to use. Well, it turns out uh, fetal tissue has never been successful in transplants for any disease. And in fact, it's tended to make the few patients that were treated with fetal tissue worse. There was a story uh, that says in 2001 in the New York Times where they tried to treat Parkinson's patients with aborted fetal tissue injected into their brain. None of the patients got better, and as it says, they reported that some of the patients were writhing, twisting, jerking uncontrollably, and the doctors themselves called the results absolutely devastating, tragic, catastrophic, and a real nightmare. Fetal tissue hasn't helped a single person. You probably heard, oh, but we've gotten all these great vaccines from fetal tissue. Well, actually not from fresh aborted fetal tissue. There are some cell lines derived originally from abortion decades ago, and they still make a few vaccines in those cells that have been grown since then. But the number's dwindling. Uh, one of the lines that we heard when that uh, debate about uh, uh, fetal tissue and David's videos first came out was, oh, polio virus was first grown in fetal tissue. Eh, false. In truth, it was never used. The original Salk and Sabin vaccine didn't use fetal tissue, human fetal tissue at all. And it's not used today. It's never been used for vaccines. And in fact, people are moving away from fetal tissue. So then you'll get this kind of uh, amorphous feeling that, well, we've got life-saving research that we're doing that will eventually lead to cures. And so we need aborted fetal tissue. In fact, it appeared 
in a story just uh, a couple of days ago in Politico. There's a proposal. I'll show you some wording here in a minute, uh, legislatively. And they were saying, well, you know, you're going to cut off all of this life-saving research. It's called the Roby Amendment. We helped uh, Martha Roby from Alabama get it into the current appropriations language. Whether it'll stay, we don't know. But very simply, none of the funds made available by this act may be used to conduct or support research using human fetal tissue if it's from an induced abortion. Let's just cut off use of that money, 107 million taxpayer dollars last year, by the way. And let's use that for some ethical and truly life-saving research and treatments. Yeah. And, and so that's another thing you need to remember when anybody asks, said, no, we don't need fetal tissue. We need to use that money for something that's truly going to be patient-centered. So what about stem cells in general? Well, this is kind of the picture a lot of people have of stem cells. You're going to go into Stem Cell Depot, right? Down to the parts department, ask for your part and model number. Hey, I need a heart for a 50, 59 model, a femur for a 57 Caucasian. Like you're going to you know, go in just like cars and swap out parts and so on. That's not the way it works. Instead, it's like this. And the term of art now is regenerative medicine instead of stem cell treatments. But for example here, if I have a heart attack, the whole organ usually doesn't go down, but parts of that muscle are damaged. And the idea would be to take stem cells, in this case from bone marrow, adult stem cells, inject into the damaged part of the heart and regenerate or repair that tissue. Now up at the top is kind of a, the generic stem cell and, and what goes on, what makes a cell a stem cell? Well, number one, it can keep growing and dividing. That's sort of the circular arrow you see top left. And number two, if you give a stem cell the right signal, it'll move to the right and specialize into any of the various tissues of the body. So you can repair or replace and regenerate the damaged tissue. And you can get stem cells from a lot of different points in our life cycle. Down at the bottom, again, we've already noted, you start over there at the left as a single-celled embryo at fertilization. After about five to seven days, you look like a little hollow ball with some cells inside. And those cells inside are the embryonic stem cells. And what they do is they literally kill, break apart that little embryo to get those cells into the dish to do experiments. Uh, being a professor, I'll, I'll do a pop quiz here. How many humans have been successfully treated with embryonic stem cells? Zero. Zero. All right. The class gets an A. How many have been treated with adult stem cells? Lots. So oh, that's a good one. I'll give you a number a little later on. But zero for embryonic stem cells. And the number remains zero. Not to say that given enough time and money, they might put one up on the scoreboard, but it relies on the destruction of a young human life. We can't ever forget that. Now you can get stem cells later on in life, what we call adult stem cells, uh, a tissue stem cell, a somatic stem cell, you don't have to be 21 years of age to own an adult stem cell. You're born with them in your tissues and organs even as a baby. They're in the umbilical cord blood and the solid part of the cord, and those are the real ones what we've generically called adult stem cells, that work. So why all this hue and cry about embryonic stem cells? We're Dr. Jamie Thompson from the Uter University of Wisconsin-Madison. First one to successfully grow human embryonic stem cells has noted that, you know, as he said, scientists have overestimated the prospects for transplantation cures using embryonic stem cells and they might be eventually uh, able to use for things, but people are still after that sort of magic solution, the one-size-fits-all solution. In point of fact, Jamie doesn't actually use human embryonic stem cells in his commercial research lab anymore. Mr. Human Embryonic Stem Cell. That, I think, shows the true failure of embryonic stem cells. But why are people still after them? Well, Kevin Egan from Harvard, I think, nails it. States will pour more money into this research and we'll all get more money. There is an economic incentive still at the state and the federal level. Uh, 
what did we usually hear and why did this, everybody get so excited about embryonic stem cells? Well, they were going to cure all of these diseases. In fact, I had one senator tell me that they had the potential to cure all known maladies. And I thought, well, what about dandruff? <laughs> anyway, uh, they, again, have not actually cured or successfully treated anybody, but you kept getting these stories. And so uh, after President Reagan passed, the story came up again. If only we'd had embryonic stem cells to treat President Reagan. Well, as uh, Ron Mackay from the National Institutes of Health said, you know, that's not really the case. You're not going to be treating patients anytime soon, if ever, with human embryonic stem cells. So why did you keep hearing these things? And as he said, people needed a fairy tale. They needed a simple storyline that was easy to understand. We're going to cure everybody. And that way we can get more money, as Kevin said. Eventually, human embryonic stem cells did get approved for a clinical trial to actually be injected into patients. I'm sure it was a coincidence that it was just a few days after Barack Obama was inaugurated. But, you know, they sort of, you might say, won the battle. They could go ahead and start treating patients. And then they discontinued the actual trial. They treated a grand total, the injected, we should say, a grand total of five patients, none of whom got any better, spinal cord injury patients. As far as we know, no one suffered adverse events, but there's a real question there. Embryonic stem cells, one of their biggest problems is a practical one. They like to grow. They like to grow fast. Uh, not only no humans, but not very many lab mice have been helped with embryonic stem cells because they tend to grow into tumors. California, back in 2006, pushed through a budget amendment to put three billion state taxpayer dollars into embryonic stem cells and cloning. And so they started giving out money from their fund, the red bar there. It wasn't very many years before you see the blue bar exceeds the red bar. The blue is adult stem cell research. Even though they had focused on embryonic, the truth, the reality was embryonic stem cells, besides being ethically challenged, are also practically useless. And the adult stem cells were the ones that were working, so they started to switch and put their money into adult stem cells. And in fact now, even though they started with just embryonic, most of their research, most of their funds are going to adult stem cells because they promised the citizens of California cures from stem cells, just drop that adjective, and all this money that would come rolling into the state to pay back. They got a payment check, by the way, a royalty check just recently. On the $3 billion pay down, I think it was about $100,000. So they're not really making a lot of money. And let's see, they haven't treated successfully anybody with embryonic. Yeah, they're going with adult stem cells. Where were they getting and continue to get these embryonic stem cells? The little frozen embryos, so-called extra embryos that are at the fertility clinics. Uh, for the longest time, we didn't know even how many were out there. And then somebody actually did a study at that point in time, over 10 years ago, there were over 400,000 of these little lives stored away, you might say, frozen down at the fertility clinics. But I kind of agree with the guy in the cartoon. They're all carrying pro-life signs. These are Little human beings earlier in their life, but they were just frozen and waiting. Here are a couple of those formerly frozen embryos, Luke and Mark, and this is from a 2001 hearing in the House of Representatives. Now, Lucinda had just given testimony to the congressman about how she had and, and her husband had adopted some of these frozen embryos and gestated them to birth, and she at the end held up this little picture under the microscope and here are these little embryos and then John stood up with Luke and Mark in his arms and goes, so which one of my sons would you kill for research? Same people, just a few months older. So you had all these frozen embryos but it turns out that there weren't enough for the research 
And so what was proposed next? Well, let's make embryos. In fact, let's clone them. Let's do human cloning. Now, this is the science fiction view again. You don't walk down the street and meet your clone, full grown and so on. Instead, you have to start with embryos. And the technical term, and unfortunately one you have to remember because they don't usually use the C word anymore. It's like I would say, well, Molly, we're going to do somatic cell nuclear transfer on you to get stem cells for cures. And your eyes kind of glazed at that science -y term. But what I said was, we're going to clone Molly, and we're going to take her clone and kill her clone for research. Put the cells in the dish, as I mentioned before. Somatic cell, you start with a body cell, like a skin cell. Nuclear transfer, we transfer the genome, we transfer the DNA into an egg that has had its chromosomes removed. That's how you got Dolly the clone sheep there. You took a sheep egg, took out its DNA and transferred the DNA, transferred the nucleus from a sheep body cell. You've got a clone, single cell clone, but just as we said before, that's the new organism already begun. And you can do a couple of things with that cloned embryo. If you put it, as you follow the arrow down to the left, into the womb of a surrogate mother, after a few months, hello Dolly. You've got a live born clone, what some people have called reproductive cloning. And of course the scientists go, oh, we don't want to do that, no. But if you follow the line down to the right, you kill the embryo, you put her cells in the dish, and they call it therapeutic cloning. Oh, it sounds a lot better. Except it's not therapeutic for the embryo. The embryo dies, and mm, there aren't any therapies from therapeutic cloning. Again, big zero in terms of any success. Yet there's still people pushing to do this type of cloning experiment. Clone and kill is probably the best way to phrase it. There have been scientists here in the U.S. who've actually succeeded. In Oregon, Dr. Metalopov and his group were able to create cloned human embryos a few years ago. And then after about a week, they killed them to put their cells in the dish to do experiments. You have to have a lot of eggs. It's a very inefficient science. And this is an actual ad that showed up in a Washington, D.C. paper a few years ago. Which comes first? The egg or the cure. It could happen to you or a loved one. And you get this list of diseases and your heart sort of goes out and, well, yeah, well, I want to do something about it, right? Well, we need women 21 to 35 years old to donate their eggs for <clears throat> stem cell research. We're going to, uh, oh, and by the way, we didn't tell you in terms of informed consent that there's about a 10 to 20 percent rate of adverse events, hospitalization, kidney failure. Some people have died from this. But still, we want you to come donate your eggs. We might even pay you a few thousand dollars. I have a friend who put together a little documentary called Exploitation. And it's funny, but it's not, because they are exploiting these women to harvest their eggs for science fair experiments, is what it amounts to. They're still pushing them. And especially on college campuses, there's still those kinds of ads showing up. Don't you want to help this couple? Don't you want to help cure disease? And so we need to have eyes open that this is still going on. It's very quiet, but they're still trying to create human clones. They're still trying to make human embryos and then destroy them for research or even gestate some of them to birth. So here's one of the newer proposals, three-person embryos or three-parent embryos, where you have, wait a minute, how do we get three? Well, because you've got mom and dad, but you've also got a third parent, a mother who's donating DNA. The aim is to take an egg that's got some DNA and then use I guess you could say mom number one's DNA and dad number one's DNA and put them all together and try and get around a particular disease. You're not treating anybody, of course. You're creating new people that you hope don't have a particular disease. And then more recently, we've heard things about gene editing or genetic engineering to create individuals that, oh, we're going to prevent disease and so on. And actually, there are a number of these things that keep rolling along about different new and interesting, we'll just say, ways to create human embryos as experiments. 
most of the time to destroy them for research. After a while, you just go, holy cow. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Uh, I, I do want to uh, ping a couple of times back to the policy area. This is about the only federal legislation we've got that prevents some of these things from going on. It's called the Dickey Wicker Amendment. It prevents federal funding, not state, but federal funding of research to create or destroy an embryo. But it's been interpreted as just that. So once the embryo is destroyed and her cells are in the dish, then you can go ahead and fund it federally. We actually got uh, a couple of years ago another little thing put in called the Adderhold Amendment that essentially prevents legally them from creating three-parent or gene-edited babies in the U.S. But there's a pretty thin line here. We don't really have a lot of legislation there to prevent some of these bioethical horrors. Uh, here's one that's been proposed. Uh, we call it the Patients First Act because it's directed towards spending federal money for research and treatments with stem cells, but ones that are going to get into the patients first. Well, that's not going to be embryonic stem cells. It's going to be adult stem cells, things that are already helping patients. So we're trying to move that forward. The executive orders are still out there that allow a certain amount of funding for those cells already in the dish. There are different uh, movements underway to try and cut off that federal funding, just as you'd like to cut off any funding for aborted fetal tissue. We want to cut off any federal funding for human embryonic stem cell creation or research. Uh, there was an attempt, a couple of heroes here, Dr. James Shirley and Dr. Teresa Deicher, who actually sued the federal government and literally shut down that funding for about two weeks a few years ago. And then the courts came back and said, no, you can go ahead and do it. But there are some new attempts underway, and hopefully at the federal as well as, the, as at the state level. We're going to keep pushing back so none of our taxpayer dollars go to these kinds of unethical research. Out in the states, there have been some movements, some very positive movements, and kind of a laundry list of different types of uh, prohibitions or encouragements as well, stopping funding for cloning, stopping funding for human-animal chimeras, these sort of hybrids. Yeah, there's some weird science going on out there. The one at the bottom I'm very proud of, Kansas actually created its own unique adult stem cell therapy center. And uh, in full disclosure, I need to say I am from Kansas and live there now and have been helping them. What we did was uh, back in 2013, after probably a couple of years of laying some groundwork, the state legislature passed and then Governor Brownback, now ambassador for international, international religious freedom, but Governor Brownback signed into law a bill that created this Kansas Adult Stem Cell Center. They cannot do anything with embryonic stem cells or aborted fetal tissue. They're focused on the patients, on treating patients, on coming up with new treatments for patients, on training doctors, on educating the public. And it's called the Midwest Stem Cell Therapy Center. They went into business July 1 of 2013 and within three months started treating patients and they're continuing to do that now. now there's, a, there's a lot of growth yet to do, a lot of patients to be treated, but things are moving in a positive direction in terms of this. A little website there with the director, Dr. Don, and we've had Archbishop Nauman out a couple of times to the center. Uh, if you weren't aware, he's the president-elect for the pro-life secretariat, uh, the pro-life group for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, he came over, was looking through the microscope at some adult stem cells, and, and uh, we briefed him up in terms of what we're doing. He's very supportive. So embryonic stem cells really didn't work. And, and for a long time, this is all you kind of heard in the media. There are only two choices, right? The guy says, I died waiting for embryonic stem cell research to find a cure. What about you? I was the embryo. So you either let the patients die or you kill embryos and come up with all of these great cures that 
never materialized. We kept trying to tell people there are alternatives. And in fact, one showed up uh, a few years ago. There were all these headlines, human embryonic stem cells without an embryo, skin cells transformed, bypass the need for an embryo. What had happened was the Japanese doctor, Shinya Yamanaka, came up with what he called induced pluripotent stem cells. He could take just a normal cell like a skin cell, add a few genes, and the resultant cells looked and acted like embryonic stem cells, but there were no embryos. There was no cloning. There was none of this genetic manipulation and so on. And it turned out these are actually not only ethically a good way to go to get the same kind of cell as you might get from embryos, they're actually better. They look and act and can, and can be used in experiments like embryonic stem cells, but you can make them from anybody. You could take a patient that has a certain disease, take some of their cells, make these induced pluripotent stem cells, and steady the disease in a dish. And that's probably their greatest asset to science now is to be used for modeling. Uh, it won Dr. Yamanaka the 2012 Nobel Prize for coming up with this great discovery. And I thought it was interesting, soon after his discovery was announced, before the Nobel, the New York Times interviewed him. And he got, how'd you come up with this and why did you? And he said, well, you know, I went over to a friend's lab and I looked through the microscope at some embryos that he had in the lab. And he said, when I saw the embryo, I suddenly realized there was such a small difference between it and my daughter's. And I thought, we can't keep destroying embryos for our research. There must be another way. So he came up with this idea. They've already been used for some kind of startling and interesting science. Uh, kidney in a dish. Well, yeah, now they're called organoids. It's not full organs or full kidneys and so on, but they can be used, again, to model disease, to study development, to figure out for drug discovery and so on. They were actually used to figure out what Zika virus was doing to little babies in the womb, and they're being used now to come up with drugs as well as vaccines to prevent the problems with the Zika virus. But the real winners in terms of the stem cell debate are adult stem cells. And I want to finish up now and go through a little more about adult stem cells as well as some of the results, because this is really good news. Back in 2001, National Institutes of Health was kind of running a competition and they're, oh, we're going to steady all there is to know about all the kinds of stem cells so we can decide once and for all what's better. And you could kind of see them scratching their head as they went through this. Like I said, what until recently anyone seriously considered that stem cells in adult tissues could make specialized cell types of another tissue and so on. It's like, wait a minute. That's not what I was taught in school. Uh, but it turned out that adult stem cells could make other tissues, just like embryonic. You could grow them in a lab, just like embryonic. You could use them to treat disease, just like, well, wait, embryonic couldn't do that. So it was what we kept hearing about adult stem cells was you couldn't do that. And it was kind of like this. It was uh, preconceptual science. So he says, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a preconceptual scientist. Well, what's that? The new science of reaching a conclusion before you do the research, and then you just dismiss anything contrary to your preconceived notion. And he starts to protest. He goes, dismissed. Well, that's what we kept hearing about adult stem cells. They can't be used. They can't be grown. You can't get enough of them. They won't treat disease and so on. Well, so here's a number you can hang your hat on, and actually it's already outdated. Up to 2012, there had been one million patients treated with adult stem cells around the world. We're getting pretty close to two million now. They just haven't caught up in terms of doing the accounting and so on. Uh, let's see, that scoreboard, million, two million versus zero. Well, hard to decide what might be the better stem cell to use. It's almost exponential in terms of, over time, the uses of adult stem cells for patients, 
not in lab research, not for animals, for human patients and alleviating their suffering. And it turns out there are lots of different tissues. Almost every tissue in your body has adult stem cells. Now, it's more common for us to use bone marrow, to use umbilical cord blood, or even the solid part of the cord. But you, know, you can get them from, my favorite, fat tissue. Hey, I can get a twofer for that one. I'll donate and all sorts of other tissues that have adult stem cells in them that can be used to treat and repair damaged tissue. Uh, cord blood is kind of an up and coming thing. We still throw away most of the umbilical cords after birth, but there are somewhere around four million births a year in the US. Even if we saved a tenth of those, stockpiled that cord blood, made it available to cross-match for patients, just like in the bone marrow registry. There are a lot of patients looking for adult stem cells, and that's really what cord blood is. It's a type of adult stem cell, but it's still the best kept secret in medicine. They're starting to treat babies in the womb. I think mean, this is just fantastic with stem cells, but it's adult stem cells. Uh, for genetic diseases, uh, Immune deficiencies, this one is a bone disease where they, it's called brittle bone syndrome, where the bones are very brittle. You can treat with donated adult stem cells and repair their bones still in the womb and more to come. Now, like anything that starts to work, there's a lot of snake oil out there and you do need to be careful. Don't just go on and say uh, on the internet, uh, stem cell treatment, oh yeah, there's one over here, or, there's one in Mexico or there's one in uh, India, I'll just go right over there. Not all of those are actually doing adult stem cells. In fact, you don't know sometimes what they're giving you. So you need to do a little background research. There's actually a place called clinicaltrials.gov, clinicaltrials.gov, that you can go and actually research FDA-approved trials and therapies. And I'll, I'll show you a website uh, a little bit later on where you can also go to catch that link. Uh, the FDA has not always been our friend in this. That's starting to change. But they have put some rules on in terms of stem cell transplants. And we always mean adult stem cells because those are the only ones that work. Uh, a few years ago, this article in the Wall Street Journal, the FDA wants to regulate your cells because they were really clamping down on just being able to use your own adult stem cells back into your body to treat your own disease. And if you'll notice, the first author, Scott Gottlieb, is now the FDA director. And what? Lo and behold, just last fall, they issued new what they call guidance in terms of trying to open this back up so that patients can be treated with their own adult stem cells as well as donated and more people can have accents. Still a ways to go on that, but the news is looking better and better and better. Here's clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, I did a search in terms of adult stem cell transplants and ones that actually were trying to do something with the patient. And the last time I checked, there were close to 4,000 clinical trials with adult stem cells going on, actually helping patients, saving lives, and improving health. Uh, here's one of the doctors that's doing that, uh, Dr. Richard Bird at Northwestern University. I, I like the sign on his door, though. Stem cell research, the potential for patients. You know, that money going to uh, embryonic stem cell research, killing more embryos, and not saving any lives, that money should be going to adult stem cell research because that's what's working. And I kind of want to just do a, a, end up with a little survey of some of the folks who have benefited from adult stem cells. This is Carol Franz. She had a disease called multiple myeloma. It's kind of a cancer that eats your bones from the inside out. She talked about how her x-rays looked like she'd been shot with a shotgun. Her bones had all these holes in it. And she calls this her before and after picture. So before, and Carol was interesting too. She illustrates another thing. I mentioned at the beginning about half of the physicians in the US don't know much about adult stem cells. So when she was first diagnosed, the first oncologist she went to 
she'd done a little bit of that internet research and goes, well, can I get a stem cell transplant? And that doctor goes, that's decades away. Well, what was he thinking? He's thinking, oh, eventually they're going to come up with something with embryonic. So she got a second opinion, thankfully. And that second oncologist said, oh, yeah, over here in the next town, there's a clinic. We'll send you over there. She got a blast of chemo. Beforehand, they had salted away about three bags of her own bone marrow adult stem cells. After the blast of chemo to kill off the cancers, an IV drip of about 15 minutes of her own adult stem cells, get some healthy cells back in there to repair the damage. And instead of a six-month prognosis, she had a six-year prognosis. And you can tell Carol was kind of a shrinking violet, uh, where this fluorescent shirt survivor, adult stem cell transplant. Some versions said not embryonic on the bottom. And we'd take her up to Capitol Hill, and she would, you know, any open door was an opportunity for her to go in and talk about how adult stem cells saved her life. Caitlin McNamara had a whole new bladder constructed from her own adult stem cells. Now, this is kind of like back to stem cell depot in a way. Not too many of that research going on, but in this case, they did grow a functional bladder, transplanted it in to replace her damaged tissue. Helen Thomas uh, was diagnosed with, with what's called critical limb ischemia. Basically, I'm losing circulation in my leg. And uh, what's the usual resolution of that? Well, we just amputate your leg. And fortunately, her doctor goes, well, wait a minute. Let's try something different. Injection of her own bone marrow adult stem cells in, which regrew the blood vessels in her leg. And she walked out of the hospital and started dancing with her hubby. Cord blood, I mentioned, which uh, we're not collecting enough of, but what we have collected and we continue to collect more and to treat more and more patients is really great because you can, as it says, help meet minority needs. A lot of times you can't find a match in the bone marrow registry, but you can find a match with cord blood. And in fact, with cord blood, you don't need a complete match all the time. You can get by with like a three out of six or a four out of six matching and treat leukemias. Here's a whole group of patients that had been treated with cord blood for various leukemias and anemias. The young man uh, in the front on the left, Keon Penn, had severe sickle cell anemia. And he was told uh, as uh, a teenager that he probably had a pretty short lifespan. He got umbilical cord blood, stem cells as a transplant, and uh, his sickle cell is gone. Same true here for Joe Davis Jr., who's sitting in between mom and dad in this picture, diagnosed at six months with severe sickle cell anemia. His parents were told he wouldn't live to be a teenager. And they looked in the bone marrow registry, and they actually looked in cord blood banks. There wasn't much available a few years ago. And they couldn't find a match. And then along came little brother Isaac on the left, and his cord blood was a close enough match. And again, Joe Jr. doesn't have sickle cell anymore. In fact, it's interesting that in the medical literature, they actually use the C word, cure, for adult stem cells with sickle cell anemia. But most people haven't heard of it. Uh, some other diseases, multiple sclerosis. Autologous means using your own, using your own adult stem cells to treat your disease. In this case, MS. Barry Gowdy had pretty severe MS, uh, had trouble putting his contacts in or feeding himself and walking, had his own adult stem cells transplanted in, and hasn't had any MS symptoms in about nine or 10 years now. Other kinds of neurological diseases, myasthenia gravis, one that affects the nerves connecting to the muscle. Again, putting people into remission. Now, I don't like to use the term cure, Barry will use the term cure and some of the other folks. But, uh, you know, even if you get into a remission for five years, that's kind of what they use as a standard for you are cured. And most of the patients, that's what they've gotten, at least five years. Uh, graft versus host disease. If you don't get a good match and you do one of these transplants, sometimes the graft, the transplant, attacks your own body. 
Well, they're coming up with a way to get around that besides just being sure you've got a good match. You can use other types of adult stem cells, this time from the solid part of the umbilical cord, to actually stop that damage. Heart failure, uh, and here are some of the geeky science papers here where they're treating for heart failure and acute heart damage, heart attacks, and so on. There's several thousand people now who've been successfully treated with adult stem cells, their own adult stem cells in most cases, for heart damage. Doug Rice is another example, congestive heart failure, and, and uh, Doug's heart was so bad that he couldn't have walked from here to this first table without stopping to rest. He got his adult stem cells to treat his heart damage, and we took him to Capitol Hill, and we couldn't keep up with him. He was just all over the place, and he just wanted to tell every member of Congress that he could come across how adults themselves saved his life. The Germans have actually been ahead of us. Uh, a friend here, Bodo Strauer, has written a couple of textbooks on adult stem cells and being able to treat heart damage with adult stem cells. And then a few years ago, I'm on a plane, I come across this in the in-flight magazine. What if you could do this after a heart attack? And I'm thinking, this would give me the heart attack. This guy's jumping out of a plane. Uh, he's been treated. In this case, it was at Emory University, still experimental, but they're advertising that they can do these types of treatments on your heart with adult stem cells. I love this uh, headline from the Washington Post. Stanford researchers stunned by stem cell experiment that helped stroke patient walk. Okay, these are the guys that set up and did the transplants on about 18 stroke patients. And they were so surprised that one of the doctors even called it miraculous. The, the geeky paper is there, but we actually have profiled one of those patients. Sonia Kuntz here now with her hubby and her little boy had damage uh, and paralysis on one side of her body and problems with her speech. And it was such that she was embarrassed to get married. And then she got this treatment, uh, it's a clinical trial, still experimental, treatment for her stroke. Within days, she started to recover. And she's now married and has a baby. It was that great a recovery. Other people that were in the uh, wheelchair after their stroke were getting up and walking. Not a cure yet, still a lot to do, but some exciting Amazing news, and it's with adult stem cells. Type 1 diabetes, uh, geeky paper, but here are a couple of patients whose diabetes was put into a remission, if you will, by adult stem cells. Limbal stem cell therapy. Well, that's the limbus is the outer part of the eye. And what these researchers had done was take the patient's own adult stem cells from the eyes on the left... There were still stem cells on there. They removed that damaged cornea, grew new corneas from the patient's own adult stem cells, and as you can clearly see, <clears throat> and they could too, after the transplant, one patient had been blind for 50 years and could now see again. Uh, this one is, is really uh, an interesting story. Nate Leao, it says, fatal genetic skin disease with donor adult stem cells. Nate had a condition called epidermolysis bullosa. Yeah, that's a mouthful, which is why you say EB. But it's a problem. It's a genetic problem where your skin really doesn't hang together well. Bottom line is you can't hug these kids because their skin falls off. And eventually uh, they will die from an infection or from cancers that start because of that. Okay, it's genetic. Can't use your own because they've still got that genetic problem. So donor adult stem cells from bone marrow as well as from cord blood. Uh, they injected these kids, including little Nate, started to grow fresh, whole new skin. Uh, another thing about skin that starts to sound a little bit like science fiction, uh, Jörg Gerlach in Pittsburgh has been experimenting with spraying on adult stem cells for burns and diabetic ulcers and stuff. It's what he calls his skin gun. And it sounds a little bit like Star Trek, but you, know, you spray your adult stem cells on, you don't immediately get skin, it's not Star Trek. But in about half the time that the old skin grafts took, 
Now you've got fresh new skin. And this is one where they actually combined adult stem cells with a little bit of gene therapy. I don't want us to paint gene editing and gene therapy you know, totally blank. We shouldn't be editing human embryos and creating new people as genetic experiments. But you can use these techniques on born individuals. And what they did was there was a young boy in Germany who had a condition similar to Nate's. And so he basically couldn't play, couldn't go outside, couldn't do anything that a normal kid would like to do because of this skin condition. And so instead of using donor stem cells to transplant, they took some of his own adult stem cells and added the correct gene to repair that genetic problem. They grew a bunch of skin, put it on his body. Uh, six months later, he was back in school playing soccer, or just kind of living a normal kid life. But again, it was adult stem cells that were critical to doing that. Uh, bottom line is adult stem cells save lives. You know, the title of the talk was Stem Cells Save Lives, but you need to keep the adjective on there. Adult stem cells save lives and improve health. Here's some of the patients. But remember, there are getting close to 2 million examples now of some of these people like Sonia, like little Joe Jr., and the list goes on and on and on. We used to have a scoreboard that we put up kind of embryonic versus adult stem cells. Uh, the score is still zero for embryonic uh, in terms of different kinds of diseases. I've lost track, frankly. I've got a, a research assistant who's trying to catch up with all the published references that show success for patients with adult stem cells. And I think we should just go to an odometer because the score does keep rolling up and up. Education is a key. And we've put together a little website we call stemcellresearchfacts.org, stemcellresearchfacts.org, where it's primarily just to uh, educate people. There's a link on that website that you can go to clinicaltrials.gov and find specifically adult stem cells, or you can leave a message for the folks that are running there, and they will try and do some of that help for you. But the idea is, as it says, to discover, to learn, to share. Uh, on the, uh, the most recent video here is Laura Dominguez. Laura had a spinal cord injury. She was quadriplegic, couldn't move her arms and legs. She was treated with her own adult stem cells. Now, she's not running any marathons. You can see she's still got a wheelchair. Uh, but as she said in the video, she can now feel her entire body. She can use her arms. She can stand. She can walk with some help. Uh, similar to Sonia, uh, after the treatment, Laura improved and so on, married and now has a little baby. But you ought to go to this website, stemcellresearchfacts.org. Look at some of these videos and pass them on. So as I mentioned early on, a challenge to you to find out more about adult stem cells and the success of the ethical stem cell, the really successful stem cell versus embryonic, and pass that on. People need this good news, and they need to have lives saved and health improved. Thank you for your time. We have time for, unfortunately, one question, and I've got all of these questions here. So David will be on my radio show, and he will answer them for us, and we'll let you know when he's going to be on, and just make sure you, you sign up for our emails, because that's the way you'll know when David's coming on the show. Uh, David, what is holding back more people from pursuing these treatments? Why, why more people? I think they're, they're kind of it's a multi-part answer, but one biggest problem is ignorance that they even exist. Just like, you know, Carol, one example where she went to the doctor and her own doctor didn't even know that they were doing these adult stem cell treatments, which literally extended her life significantly. So it's again why, you know, one of the people you ought to be telling about this is your doctor, as well as your friends, your family members, your coworkers colleagues at, at school and so on. But there's also a money problem. Clinical trials are expensive to run. 
And that money that's going to embryonic stem cells and fetal tissue, it'd be kind of nice if that was going to adult stem cell research and therapies. And so we really need to, frankly, lobby our elected representatives that they need to put taxpayer dollars, state and federal, towards ethical, successful, research and treatments. That's, that's the whole point of that Patients First Act. Thank you very much.